Open your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 10. <clears throat> Mark chapter 10, and we're going to pick up in verse 32. And, and, and what we want to do is sort of join the journey. Um, we know as you look at Christ's ministry from the very beginning, it was always headed towards the cross. You know, you, Mark, Mark loved to give you little hints of this along the way. And, and so we're going to sort of join the journey in the middle here just for uh, time's sake, but also um, to, to bring a right into the triumphal entry. Now, Mark didn't, um, Mark didn't take part in all of this. Mark is most likely writing down uh, Peter's memories as uh, best we can tell that Mark is probably recording um, Peter's recollection of things, and he might have picked some information up off of some of the other gospel writers. But I can imagine, <clears throat> as you pick up in chapter um, 10, um, verse 32, you can imagine Peter as an older man. This was probably written um, in the about around 60 AD, maybe a little bit later, um, probably before 70. And so it had been about 30, over 30 years since um, Christ had been crucified. And, and, and uh, I can imagine Peter, an older man, looking at young Mark and, and, and telling him, this is his memories, this is what I remember this one day. And uh, I'd be leaning forward in my chair, wanting to hear from Peter. Peter be going, you're supposed to write it down. <laughs> Because I'd get lost in the stories for sure. Verse 32. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was going before them. <clears throat> and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And, and then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them. Notice he said again. He took them aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests, to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock, mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. <clears throat> It said they were amazed and, and afraid, and it really uh, sets the tone of this journey towards Jerusalem that it was sort of characterized, at least in the disciples' eyes. Now we're talking about the disciples uh, and apostles, and maybe all of those that were following. It's characterized somewhat by amazement, but maybe more importantly, fear. And uh, <clears throat> you go, well, why were they, what were they afraid of? Well, Going to Jerusalem was a dangerous thing when the high priests, the Pharisees, Sadducees were not going to welcome them. And that was for sure. And then in addition to that, um, Rome, especially at Passover, Rome was really kept a tight rein on things. And people that brought uh, trouble, that stirred trouble, uh, especially during Passover, would be dealt with pretty swiftly by Rome. And so... You can imagine these guys going, this is really a bad time, Jesus. <laughs> Maybe we should pick, you know, not understanding. Because even though he told them in, uh, what was coming, in, in Matthew, he records it, that they didn't get it. They, they didn't have the capacity to understand these things yet. And, and Mark doesn't give us really any direct response to, to what was going on. Um but we, get, we certainly get the indication that they didn't understand. Characterized by fear, maybe fear of Rome, fear of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the high priests. There was a, a tradition that uh, amongst the Jews that uh, when the, the king, when their Messiah took the throne, that there would be uh, a big war uh, you know, that would precede the establishment of the enthronement of him as king. And, uh, and part of that tradition was that the Jewish sort of aristocracy and the, the, that they would end up as be as evil as Rome during the time when this war would come about. And so if in their mind you're thinking, 
Jesus is going in. He's going to boot out the Romans. He's going to sit on the throne and take authority and, and begin to rule and reign. Then there had to be a nervousness about that and wondering, is this going to be a great war and uh, how this would end? And then there's just the physical aspect, just the whole idea of following Jesus. It, and, and Mark really, because it's so fast-paced, he really sets that tone that this, this was a relentless pursuit of the mission that he was called for. And, uh, and, and you can imagine this is a, from the uh, road of Jericho up to Jerusalem was like a 2,600-foot ascent. And, and uh, man, you had to have, you'd had to have, be in good shape to do that and to do it um, diligently. So you imagine that uh, there was a lot of people saying, I wish he'd slow down a little bit. But you can see that Christ is setting the timing for all this. There's no, he's, he, there's no surprises that he is in complete control of what is happening and what is about to happen. And so um, Mark's message that we sort of get through the, the disciples as they're looking at this is that, you know, following Jesus isn't, wasn't all miracles and mountaintop experiences. That, it, that this was a hard and dangerous and relentless and there was, they were struggling with fear. And I'm trying to keep fear at bay and, uh, and learn about this, this idea of walking in faith and following Christ. And man, I think we can all relate to that. I know I sure, certainly can. It's certainly not always, uh, it's not all, always a mountaintop experience and it oftentimes feels very lonely. And, it, and it's getting uh, more and more so as we see the world continue to change. But I think we get a good I think we get a good glimpse at uh of the apostles' response when we look just uh, beyond this passage we read. And I don't want to read it all, but for the interest of time, but at, at verse thirty five in chapter ten, we see that James and John um went to, to Jesus and basically said, Teacher, we want you to do something for us and Jesus like, What would that be? And so, well, we need you to it's almost like saying, we promise you'll do us a favor, and then we'll tell you what it is. And they wanted to sit at the, on the right and on the left of Jesus when he came to glory. And um, he just told them that he was going to be beaten and mocked and scourged and spit on. And they said, but can we sit on your right and your left when you come to glory? It's as if they just completely, you know, sort of, bypass that and of course there may have been some time passed before this conversation in all fairness but still what's on their mind was their own place in this glory and how it was going to affect them and if you go down to to uh, verse 42 then um, Jesus said you know that those who are uh, considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them and I think they would have said, well, yeah, yeah, we understand that. That's kind of what we, why we wanted to be in that place of authority. Yet it shall not be so among you, verse 43, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. In verse 44, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be a slave of all. Interesting, and they, they they had their eyes on becoming this authority. The we're tired of being under the the rule of of the Romans. We're tired of being pressed upon by the high priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees of being buried in their laws and their ways and their tradition. And now Jesus is going to come to the throne, and things are going to change. Jesus, can we sit on your right and on your left? Can we can we help you rule and reign? And and this is just asking for the top cabinet positions in his, um, in his sort of what we would think of as presidency. They just didn't get it. They didn't know. They didn't understand that he was about to, he was going to be betrayed and he was going to die. And in Mark's beautiful way, he sort of portrays the the apostles' response, and we can say this is James and John, but if you read that passage, it says the other the others heard what James and John were saying and they got a little upset because they felt like they deserved those positions too. 
And so this was all of them. This was all of the apostles. They just didn't get it. We put ourselves in that place. We go, well, <laughs> I'd have got it, right? You'd have got it, right? And uh, <sighs> I wouldn't have got it. In Mark's beautiful way, then, he shows us someone that did get it. He brings us right to verse 46. Now they came to Jericho, and he went out of Jericho and his disciples and a great multitude. A blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of God, the son of David, excuse me, have mercy on me. And the many warned him <clears throat> to be quiet. You know, all the crowd said, shh, keep it down. He cried out even louder, all, all the more it says, Son of David, have mercy on me. <clears throat> Verse 49, so Jesus stood still and he commanded him to be called. And they called the, the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, well, what do you want me to do for you? <clears throat> the blind man said to him, Rabbi, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight. And he followed Jesus on the road. I can never read Blind Bartimaeus enough. He's just always so encouraging to me. But you see a man that got it, a man that had no physical eyes, but his spiritual eyes were wide open. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming, he cried out to him. And no one would keep him from crying out to him. He cried out to him and, and begged for mercy, begged that he would heal him. Knowing, he cried out, knowing that this was the one, this was the place of hope. This is the one that could make a difference in his life. And his faith made him well and he received his sight. Matthew tells us there were two blind men. And it's interesting that, that one is talked about in a, in a couple of the Gospels and named here. Mark names him. But the other one is not mentioned in this gospel. And you can say, well, that was the way it was remembered by some, and there's lots of interesting ways to think of that. I, I tend to think of it that when you're looking back in over 30 years, you remember the one person that's the name of the one that is still walking with the Lord and is still with the disciples and is still ministering and is still talking about the day that Jesus came by and I cried out to him. You can imagine the testimony of this man that he told anybody that would listen that my life was characterized completely and wholly by blindness, by being poor, that he sat in the same place without hope and he began to hear of hope in the name of Jesus. And it's a good thing he didn't listen to the advice to those that said, shh, it's a good thing he didn't worry about being embarrassed. It's a good thing he didn't worry about, well, what will people say if I start crying out to Jesus in public and then you think I'm a Jesus freak? But man, he cried out to Jesus. He, I'm, I'm sure this man his whole life, you can call me a Jesus freak, you can call me anything you want. I was blind, but now I see. And I find that exciting and the, to think of the testimony of this man in the ministry and what happened to the other man? We don't know his name. We don't really know. I find it interesting. Chapter 11, now when they drew near uh, Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and he said to them, uh, go into the village opposite you and, and as soon as you have entered it, uh, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. 
and immediately uh, we will, um, and immediately he will ascend it here. Uh, so they so they went on their way, and they found the colt tied at the door outside of on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those that stood near said to him, to them, oh, "What are you doing, loosing the colt?" And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, and so they, they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And, and many spread their clothes on the road. And others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And those who went before and those who uh, followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. And so when he had looked around at all things at the hour as the hour was already late he went out to bethany with the 12 turn with me to zechariah 9 9 <clears throat> zechariah 9 9 as jesus uh, sends these men to retrieve this uh, colt. He is in the process of fulfilling prophecy. He said they would find a colt um, uh, on which no one had sat. And so we see that, that um, this is part of the fulfillment of the prophecy. So let's, let's read 9, nine Zechariah 9.9. 9. First, rejoice greatly. O daughter of Zion, uh, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Uh, he is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so he is fulfilling this prophecy. The idea of riding a colt uh, that had not been ridden before was that it was to set aside for sacred purpose. But it's interesting because Normally, you didn't just jump on a colt and ride it, a, a donkey. And so this would have been about, he said, normally a donkey would have to be like three years old. I think it was three years old before you could really ride it. You could, you could hurt it uh, to hold, hold a full-grown man. And so this was probably about a three-year-old. They said at that age, you were going to start riding this, that it would take uh, normally a couple of months of training in order for you to be able to ride this. And, and so you almost see a sort of a supernatural response in that. But these men go, they retrieve this colt as directed. They are questioned as expected. Uh, you can imagine th it's Passover. The city is flooded with people. People are opening their homes. It is um, just overwhelmed at Passover. The city was just overwhelmed with people. And someone comes and strangers take this colt. They would be questioned. But it was apparently either set up or it was understood that that uh, when they heard that the Lord needed it, that that it was became okay, that they knew where it was going and it was no longer a question. And so they take the colt to back to Jesus and and they threw their clothes on it, which is sort of the first clothes going on this would be sort of this makeshift saddle to really the first one going on there would be for comfort, you know, that they threw clothes on this as sort of a saddle. And then they began to spread their clothes on the road and, and others cut these leafy branches. And so you see the idea of, the, of palm branches being thrown down. And, and it, in, a, in a sense, where it is a uh, like rolling out the red carpet. And, and it is, it is a, a, a way of elevating, of, of, of recognizing him as the king, that he is him riding in this fulfillment of prophecy that he is the Messiah, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and that um, we're going to roll out this red carpet that he, he does not walk on the same ground that we walk on but that we roll out this, uh, this red carpet so in a way to elevate him and uh, to show our honor and, uh, and to revere him as he is presented. So, 
you can look at the 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 palm branches the, that are cut and waved and thrown. You can see this in several places. It's interesting. You see palm trees in the design of the temple even. And uh, there were different things in sort of the Jewish culture where they would wave palm branches. In some cases, you're not even sure why they were waving them. It was, became a tradition, and they, they um, waved them at certain times. You can see some of that at Leviticus 23 at the Feast of Tabernacles. And, uh, and you can see also when Jehu was uh, declared king in uh, 2 Kings 9, and you see the palm branches show up there. Uh, it's it's, it's an interesting Bible study. Look look up all the use of palm branches and the palm trees and in the Bible and uh, the context, and it becomes kind of fascinating. So Jesus is on this this uh, donkey and begins to make this entry, and um, uh, I think it's um, I don't think I wrote it down, but I think it's Luke that records that as Jesus is approaching that the Pharisees um, hear what is going on. They begin to hear this, Hosanna, Hosanna. And uh, and they say, you need to address the, the disciples. You need to silence them that they should not be, you know, these people should not be talking that way. And they didn't like what they were hearing then because it immediately becomes this challenge to their authority, to their power. And they had... Um, it really puts them in a situation where they had to address it. And it's really when Jesus says that if they, if they were quiet, the, the rocks would cry out. That this is, this is an event, this is a time that even the rocks would proclaim what is going on if you could silence all the people. We also see as Jesus is uh, coming down toward to from the Mount of Olives and on this... Um, on this ride that he also um, weeps uh, weeps over Jerusalem. We see that in the other gospel accounts. That he knows, it's as if he knows what he is going to find. He knows what is there. He knows that um, what the, the destiny of Jerusalem and he, and he begins to weep. Um, to weep over that city. Hosanna is a uh, is a declaration it means save us. It is, comes from uh, Psalm 118. These uh, grouping of songs that were uh, psalms that were sang in in a longing um, for Messiah. Often these psalms accompanied uh, uh, the celebration of Passover and, and really many of the feasts, but I think Passover specifically. These uh, grouping of psalms and so. There was always sort of this idea of looking for our, and longing for our Messiah, but but in this case, it, there was a recognition by at least by some. And uh, but but it's but it is fascinating because as you go to verse eleven, then it says Jesus um, went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So is this entry sort of? almost uh, mimics, you know, what used to be a, uh, we, we see a triumphal entry of a great general. A Roman general that killed 5,000 people in a, in a war would, would come back and, and bring his spoils of war, his prisoners of war. He would ride in on, a, on his mount with all his glory and he would be praised and celebrated. And often when they when they conquered another territory, the first thing that they would do was go to the temples of the gods that were worshipped in that area, and uh, and they would honor those gods because they didn't want to anger the other gods. So they all, in their mind, they needed to honor these gods, even though they conquered the people. And 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 the idea was that they were always just trying to take on all of these gods for favor. And uh, and when Jesus comes in. Now, the king of kings comes in. He comes right to the temple. He comes to the key, to to the the place where people worship God, where the Jews are um, are supposed to be ministered to by God, and where God is ministered uh, to the people through the priest there. 
And, and he went to Jerusalem. He went to the temple. And it says he looked around. In verse 11. There was no reception. No one was waiting for him to arrive. No one was there to welcome him. Um, it was late. And there was nowhere in Jerusalem for him. And he went out to Bethany with the twelve. It's got to be one of the saddest verses in the Bible. He went out after looking around the temple and all that was going on. Everything that was happening in the temple should have been pointing to Jesus Christ. Every sacrifice, every Passover lamb, everything was a picture of Jesus Christ. And yet when Christ himself came to the temple, he was not recognized, welcomed. No one saw the ultimate fulfillment of Passover, the Passover lamb. <clears throat> Verse 12, now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he um, would find something on it. When we came to it, he found nothing but, but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to, to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Turn your Bibles to Micah 7. This is an interesting passage to study because it bothers so many people. It bothers so many scholars. And you read so much that because it's a negative, this is a, a destructive miracle, I guess is the way they label it. That Jesus, and, and you see even some of the writings, is like this poor fig tree didn't do anything to deserve that. It's like it's his fig tree, you know. But you're missing the point if, you're, if, you, get, if you get stuck on this fig tree. And so what, you're, what we're looking at is what the, the scholars call a Markin sandwich. And, and so you, what, what you see is... Uh, you see the first piece of bread is the fig tree, and then you, we're going to see him going back to the temple, and then you see the fig tree again. And, and Mark does this all the time, and actually you could open that up to a double-decker sandwich if you really wanted to look at this. But Mark does this Mark does this all the time, and he sort of inserts a story in a, in a story, and they call them Mark and Sandwiches. And when you're studying Mark, you've got to look for those because they're fascinating. They're always related, and they have inter and one is always sort of adding and showing the message of the proverb, the idea of the big message in it. So, um, And so <clears throat> you go, why would Jesus, why is Mark talking about this fig tree? Um, Micah 7. Woe is me, for I am like those who gather summer fruits, like those who glean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat, of the of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires. The faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. That they may successfully do evil with their hands, the prince asks for gifts, the judge seeks a bribe, and the great man utters his evil desire. So they scheme together. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. With the day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. You see a man, woe is me, longing for fruit. And then by verse 2, Suddenly he's talking about the faithful man has perished from the earth. That the fruit is the faithfulness that he longed for. This is the fruit. The fig tree is often used. Um, you see it through a scripture with a fig tree. It represents uh, Israel in, in many prophetic passages. 
And Jesus just wanted, was longing to see fruit. And there was no fruit to be found. You can see lots of talk about the season of figs. There was no figs. and there was, Why would Jesus be looking for figs on a, when it was out of season? And, and the whole idea is the fig tree had leaves, which was the promise of life, of fruit. But in reality, there was no fruit to be found. And it is the object lesson of the temple. And Mark is inserting this story in here. Um, to make the point of the temple. Jesus cursed the fig tree and there would be no fruit and no opportunity to bear fruit again. Verse 15. We'll talk more about that in a moment. We get the other half of the sandwich. Verse 15. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Well, all, all of a sudden we see Jesus who had ridden in on the donkey, humble, lowly, for the first time presented himself as, as Messiah. Well, previously in his ministry, he kept saying, go, go, and don't tell anybody, keep it low key. He was controlling the tempo, he was controlling the timing, but then the time had come. He rode in, presented himself as the Messiah. He comes to the temple. He looks around. He's not recognized, received in any way. He returns the next day, bringing a whip. And he goes into the temple, and he begins to clean house. Now, you've got to understand, again, we're in the middle of Passover, and it was absolutely, uh, absolutely overrun with people. Everywhere, it would have been just so full. And, and in reality, one man going through the temple doing this probably didn't phase them too much. It probably didn't make an overwhelming difference. But the, the, it wasn't the idea of how much he did, but it was who was doing it. That was the idea in, in what Mark is showing us. So he was driving out those that bought and sold in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. So this is the court of the Gentiles. And and what they're doing is people traveled from great distances. You were supposed to pass over. You selected your lamb. You would bring your lamb. It had to be sort of the setup rules. It had to be inspected by the priests. And it had to be approved by the priests. We didn't want to bring your animal all the way with you. And the priest said, no, nah, it's not good enough. you got to buy one of ours. And this is the racket that they had set up. It's like, you need to buy one of ours. And those ours are pre-blessed. They're pre-approved. And so you, had, you could buy a pre-approved uh, Passover lamb. And they were selling doves. And, uh, and then you, you had to pay your temple tax while you were there. And so they only took temple coins. So... And they were in control of the exchange rate. So all of these other uh, coinings and all these other governments all around from which the Jews would come to Jerusalem and bring all their money and they'd have to exchange it for temple coin to pay their tax. And they controlled the exchange rate. So it was quite a scam, quite a, quite a deal. Um, it was, um, there was some evidence they used to sell Passover lambs on the Mount of Olives. But apparently that became inconvenient, so they moved it right into the court of Gentiles, and you can imagine they've rooted out all of the worship and all of the taken all of the space for the marketplace, where there was no room to do what needed to be done, and for the purpose of the temple in the court of the Gentiles. Verse sixteen says he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple, as a sentence that sort of. Um, Stumbles a little bit, and scholars not sure what to do with it. And, and many think that that the language of that um, is that he essentially wouldn't allow them to carry any sacrifices through into into uh, through that uh, port of the Gentiles into the temple area. That he essentially stopped for at least some period of time. That he stopped the sacrifices. That he wouldn't let anything through, which is kind of fascinating. Verse 17, then he uh, taught. So he upset the 
the money changers, he upsets everything, he's driving people out that are selling. He stops the sacrifice, and then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. Let's go to Isaiah 56. Pick the context up of that. Isaiah 56, I think we're going to verse, let's do verse 6. Isaiah 56, 6. Jesus had quoted Isaiah when he said, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. But um, we're going to look at the bigger context of what he didn't say. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast to my covenant, even uh, them I will bring to the holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Um, Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices uh, will be accepted on my altar, for uh, my house shall be called a house of prayer. For all the nations, uh, the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel says, yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. This is uh, the whole passage. If we backed up for the whole passage is is the uh, uh, speaking of God calling the nations, the Gentiles, that he was calling the Gentiles even to come and worship. That there was a time coming and that, that that should have been a place of prayer. That should have been a place for the, the nations. This was what the, the whole purpose of the temple and God coming to the, to the Jews was to reveal himself through, through the Jews and to the temples that the temple we would see the, the law exercised and the need for uh, a, a, a perfect sacrifice, a, a need for the Messiah that we can never keep the law. There's not enough animals to slaughter and to keep covering the sin and the shedding of blood and, and they said, uh, Josephus writes that 256,000 lambs sacrificed at Passover in, in one year, in one time, and the blood was just a river of blood. And, and it, it's just this ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. And so oh, the temple wasn't doing what it was set up to do. The priests were not doing what they were called to do. But they were supposed to be displaying God's righteousness and holiness. And that they would be a testimony to all the nations, but instead they had become um, they had become what they wanted it to be, and they had pushed aside all of those other things to the point where they didn't even recognize Jesus when he stood before them. That's crazy. He said it had become a den of thieves. What's a den of thieves? That's where the thieves, after they've stolen and robbed somebody blind, that's where they run back to hide, right? And divvy up the loot. That's the safe place. That's their little den. That's where nobody's chasing them, that they can, they can hide out there and they can divvy up. And, and they're in control of everything in their den. And he said, These, this has become a den of thieves. This isn't, this isn't a house of prayer. What a contrast. Verse 18, and the scribes and the chief priests heard it and they saw how they might be destroyed, how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. Jesus rode in as the Messiah, controlling the timing and forcing their hand they didn't want to do anything with all this crowd around, right? They didn't want to, they didn't want to do any, uh, make any move against Christ with all of these people around that Jesus forced their hand. Well, he comes into the temple and does this. They had, to, they had to move. And so instead of looking the king of kings in the eye and, and, and turning in repentance, 
of recognizing who he was. But instead, they, they decide, we've got to figure out how to destroy him, how to get rid of him. This is the religious uh, authorities in the culture plotting death. Verse 19, when evening came, he went out of the city. And now in the morning, here's the other side of the sandwich. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered away. Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to the mountain, this mountain be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he uh, says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, Believe that you receive them, and you will have them. It's an interesting response to a shriveled up fig tree. But when you understand the fig tree was very symbolic of Jerusalem and the temple, Israel in general, Jerusalem in general, but the temple very specifically symbolic of that, that it bore no fruit, that instead of this sort of almost cult that the temple had become of just this fanaticism of going through this uh, this rote and, and uh, exercise and and it was sinful men declaring declaring righteousness in to sinful men without any authority to do so without without any uh, without any representation of God at all They weren't doing what they were called to do, quite simply. And so with the fig tree is withered up, temple, it, it would be a day when the temple would be destroyed. And many would look, what do we do now? How do we respond? And really, if anybody was looking, they would have asked that long before because there was no fruit at the temple. And then it, and the, the answer was have faith in God. That a person can come to God in that if you truly believe that who could move a mountain? Who could, who could come through the eye of a needle, the camel? I mean, all these things are possible when faith is directed at God when faith is of God. The rabbis taught that great leaders were, were the rooters up of mountains. I love that. The great faith leaders, those that, that believe and have faith, we can say the same thing. We can see the same thing. But those that don't, they don't play by the same rules because they play by God's rules and they let him call the shots and they don't ever look and say, well, God can't pull that off. Well, God can't do that. But they look without doubt and say, it'll be exactly what God would have it be. And I believe that it is in God's will that this would happen. When they become the rooter up, rooters up of mountains, it's hard to say. But I, I love that picture that it presents. And so there's your mark and sandwich. The fig tree bore no fruit. The temple was cleansed. The fig tree was found withered. And the fig tree was cursed. It had all the signs of being uh, productive as it bore fruit. But its appearance meant nothing. It only offered a false hope. It is exactly what Jesus is pointing to towards the temple. It had all the signs of being a productive man. There was lots of activity and lots of stuff going on there, yet 
it bore no fruit. The culture it had, had come to believe this was where God's redemptive work was happening. And as I said, it just became a false hope that there was nothing going on there. Faith in the temple, in the priest, in the sacrifices, and all of those things did nothing. It was never about that. It was faith. It was always faith. Coming to God was always coming by faith. Always has been, always will be. Pardon me. All these patterns, all these types and shadows, all these things that were that were called to be performed at the temple were not done to to create righteousness, but done to point toward Jesus Christ to be a context for faith, an opportunity to worship God. Yet they found righteousness in their works and their heritage as sons and daughters of Abraham's and on, Abraham and on and on. The fig tree was has always been symbolic. Uh, John the Baptist had given this warning at the beginning of his ministry, right prior to of baptizing Jesus, and he said, "Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire." And it, it was it was the temple presented a, a a pretend fruit that made the sinful men feel better about their sinful lives. Man, that is if that doesn't serve as a warning in our culture in our time, there's so much of that going on, and it's being called church. And we gather together, and. We socialize and we do social things and there's lots of busyness going on, but there's really no fruit. And it's sinful men making other sinful men feel better about their lives. And in the end, let me say this will be very harsh sounding, but if there is no fruit, it becomes a comfortable place from which to go to hell. Notice the fig tree dried up at the roots and it withered. It lost its sustenance. Lost its nutrition. The temple had lost its sustenance, its nutrition, its life, its very life that came. Remember the picture of the in Zechariah of the oil flowing to right into the lampstand. Picture of the Spirit alive and flowing and endless. But that had been cut off, dried up, and all the works had withered and and all that was withered would be destroyed. And so we see Jesus' response was not so much to cleanse the temple, but to condemn what was going on there. He said it probably didn't have much of an impact on on them, probably slowed them down, interrupted them for a little bit. Certainly should have got their attention, but it didn't. God had came to earth to complete the redemption of mankind. And he wasn't welcomed in the very place that was supposed to be the focal point of worship. And the response was, how do we get rid of this guy? It's just an amazing thing. In the real temple of the Lord, Christ himself was be cursed and he himself would wither and bear our sins on the cross. But that would not be the end. The Jews saw the temple as permanent. Nobody could destroy the temple. It would be like casting a mountain into the sea. It's just not going to happen. The temple would be something that, I mean, even an army couldn't come against the temple. In their mind, that's what they thought. And if you want to read something really gross, disgusting, read how Rome destroyed the temple in 70 AD. People ran in 
and hid it out. And uh, they took it down and they burned it up. Uh, some say not purposely. But uh, the way they treated the people, and it, it was just, uh, it was brutal. Only you can discover those details on your own. They thought it was just absolutely impossible for anything to happen in the temple. It would be like a mountain being cast in the sea. It was about as impossible as a dead man coming back to life. But those impossible things were about to be done. It would be like a blind man being able to see. When you look back and you look across the part of the journey we looked at, we see the disciples, the apostles were blind to what was right before them, what was going on, characterized by fear. And they run into a man that was blind and had no eyes. And his life is characterized by faith calling out to Jesus. I think it's fascinating. And you go to the temple, the very religious people that ought to be teaching faith, and he finds no faith. Um, I got to wrap up. I'm jumping through my notes here. Our approach to Jesus um, should not be one of running a gauntlet through the temple, appeasing money changers and priests, and as we sort of we sort of picture these people just. A, a groping for God, trying to work through all of the obstacles that have been thrown in their way. And, and we shouldn't have sort of a litmus test, too, of, of anyone that comes to faith that to look some way, act some way, carry the right Bible, sing the right songs, wear the right clothes, whatever it is. You, see, you find those things, and nobody wants to own them. Nobody would say, well, that's... We all have that tendency... We all have that tendency to look at those things that way. But when we come to Christ, we should never have to run a gauntlet of obstacles to find Him. But I love going back to, to Bartimaeus, that he would not be stopped. That had he been reserved and said, I don't want anybody to think I'm obnoxious. I don't want anybody to think I'm a Jesus freak. No, he cried out, Jesus, Son of David. He, he knew he was the Messiah. He knew he was the King of Kings. And he would not be silenced because that was his hope. That is your hope. That is your only hope. And man, it's so important to know that in the day we find ourselves. Run to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. No matter where you're at. It is so important. You look at Bartimaeus, what did he do? He threw his, he threw his coat, probably the only thing this man owned, but it represented that old life. He threw it off. He left it because he had something new. He was going to be clothed in Christ. It's sort of the picture of leaving the old garment behind and coming forward and being clothed in Christ. Run to Jesus. Throw away the old life. It's just an old rag. <clears throat> it's worth nothing. Time is short.